to track it welcome to your nooner with dooner your fiver with the drivers thanks for tuning in on the live stream sirius xm's road dog trucking podcast listeners youtube facebook tiktok linkedin don't think i'm forgetting anyone no matter how you're listening thanks for coming on the show today by the way a couple big milestones that happened hope you all had a great easter by the way hope your bracket isn't busted like mine i had tennessee i'm out but a few big milestones it's episode 700 here on what the truck take a look at that beautiful cake because it also happened to be my birthday over the weekend thank you to my lovely wife and kids 700 of these things 60 minutes each four interviews a show that's 2800 interviews what a road what a road take a look too check out my stanley cup drop that picture yeah Official What the Truck Stanley Cup delivered to my door on Saturday for the birthday. Mm. It tastes so good. All right, some big news. By the way, I kind of hate April Fool's Day, and this is not an April Fool's joke. There'll be no April Fool's jokes on this show. But here, I'm a huge Tekken fan, and Harada, the producer of Tekken, he has gotten wise to the Waffle House. He put out, he tweeted, why is everyone asking me why Waffle House should be a Tekken stage? And fortunately, a lot of people filled him in. They said Waffle House is a 24-hour franchise restaurant that gets a lot of drunk men on the weekends who don't go home with a girl. Because of this, they are frustrated and tend to get into a lot of fights. Uh, let's see here. Briefcase says it's a common meeting spot for mutual combat in the United States. It has notoriety because the employees are also battle-hardened. Uh, JKO says Waffle House is a U.S. restaurant chain that culturally is heavily associated with brawling because the employees are trained to defend themselves. And it says uh, the Waffle House is even used by the uh, by the government to check disaster relief. Hey, I hope it comes in there. I'll get the DLC. All right, on episode 700 of What the Truck, I'm talking to Campbell University's Sal Mercagliano about the latest on the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse. It's almost been a week. That happened in the uh, early in the morning on Tuesday of last week. We're going to find out who's on the hook to pay for it, how long it's going to take, what it may cost, how it'll impact shipping. Sal has some of those answers. He is the authority on this. We got Freightways' Thomas Wasson. He dives in the data behind the market. How did Q1 look? Will Q2 be an employment? I mean, an improvement? An employment. We all might be looking for an employment if it isn't. Dick Justice, Mac Dickman is here. He calls himself the Gordon Ramsay of warehousing. We'll learn what the hell that means. And a bunch more, but Sal's here, so let's not waste any time. Sal Mercagliano, PhD at Campbell University. And he's not even wearing the, uh, the camel head today. I, I am not wearing the camel head today. And by the way, happy 700, Duna. You don't look a day over 699. I got to say. Day or, you, you know, that's fantastic. the bad thing about birthdays, milestones. Like every day you keep aging anyway. Like it just doesn't stop. It beats the alternative. Yeah, it could be dead. Could be dead. How was your Easter? <laughs> Did you have a great Easter weekend? I did have a great Easter weekend. The problem is we have a mixed house in my house. I went to the University of Alabama and my wife went to the University of North Carolina. So we had a kind of a little bit of a problem watching the basketball this weekend. Oh, oh it's got to be brutal. My Tennessee got knocked out for me. And like the, the insult to injury is not only did Tennessee get knocked out, but I basically I have no path to winning the freight waves like pool tournament anymore. It was just it, it was done. Well, I'm hoping for a roll tide, but I don't know. We got to get past UConn first. And let me be clear, NC State has been upsetting a lot of people. Everybody's got to figure out a way to uh, play against Burns. It's going to be a tough one for any team to get forward past. I like the big fella. That's who I like. I like that. That's my team now. I'm going with the big heavy set dude. Bur Burns, he's great. He's he's fun to watch. And they, they, they have been dogged all season long. And I think they just don't care. And they want to play a great game. Yeah. Well, hey, so we got to get into a little bit of serious business here, unfortunately. <laughs> Last week, major collapse. We all saw the shocking footage that came out uh, around 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. And so that was like, that video was out immediately. I woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I saw that. And I was like, is that, you know how, you know, is that even real at first? Is that AI, all that? And I was, I was looking at, but some progress has been made. I heard they've pulled some trusses on here. They've made a waterway. What's the latest on what's happening with this, uh, this incident? Yeah, so we got an update this morning from the Unified Command team. They are starting to work on removing some of the steel trusses. They're cutting high on some of the areas that are not near the ship. What you're seeing right there is the fact that the bridge is across the dolly. And as you see that zoom going forward, that's the main channel there just to above the ship. So all of that is blocked. They're working on sections of the bridge right now that are not near the channel. So they're trying to get weight off the bridge. The other element is... 
parts of the bridge are still standing. The truss area is the one collapse. The Coast Guard is out putting some buoys in for a new channel, but this is going to be a very shallow draft channel. You're talking about maybe tugs and barges at most coming through that area. It'll open up uh, Baltimore to some traffic, but nowhere near the major traffic. They cannot open up this port until they remove the dolly and get that section of the bridge between the two pylons out of the way, either by raising it or dragging it out of the way so that they can open up 90 percent of the port of Baltimore. So who is in charge of this whole sort of like recovery, rebuilding operation? Well, funny you said that because I, I just got a video coming out today where I sent a note out this morning asking that question. And when I got back from the unified command uh, team was like, we're all working together, which is great. <laughs> rainbows and unicorns, but not really what you need on an oversight of a salvage operation this big. There should be a single incident commander. And, and my problem is there's been some confusing statements put out. So, for example, in the latest update, they talk about that the, the captain of the port, the Coast Guard captain, is the federal on-scene commander. But we've got the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. we got the Navy supervisor of salvage on scene. You've got the Maryland Department of Transportation on scene, let alone three separate salvage companies that are working this area. This is a very elaborate situation. They really need to clearly identify who's in charge so that they have a clear plan of how to execute the three different salvages they have to do. Get yeah, sell on Friday's show, I'm talking to one of the dredging companies that is working on this project and helping get some of those trusses out there. So hopefully we'll get some answers out of them. But as we are right now, supposedly this is costing $9 million a day, right? What, what kind of supply chain impacts are we seeing here? This is a, the port's noted for automobiles, right? Roro, farm equipment, those kind of things. Is this, is this being absorbed? What are we looking at here? Yeah, so I mean, Port of Baltimore last year moved 43 million tons of cargo, 73 billion uh, dollars worth of equipment. So this is substantial. Baltimore is not the biggest port in the world in the United States by any means, not even the top 10, but it is a significant, you know, medium sized port. And as you mentioned, it's really key in export of farm equipment. Uh, but probably the biggest thing that they are doing is, is exporting coal and import of sugar and salt. You can move containers. You can drop. And one of the things we're seeing right now for shippers is a lot of the ocean carriers are declaring force majeure, yeah. which means they're be, going to be able to drop off their containers anywhere. It doesn't matter for the shipper. They're going to have to deal with it. So if I drop my container off in Houston, you're going to have to deal with it. Not my fault. So that's going to be a big impact. But perhaps the biggest thing we're going to see is an impact in insurance because the insurance liability here is massive. Uh, we don't know how far this is going to go. We're talking about potentially billions of dollars. And what we could see is insurance for ships coming into the United States be substantially raised, especially if they're going into ports with infrastructure that has not been kind of hardened or fortified to deal with these big ships. The big problem Baltimore had is they dredged the harbor, they brought in these new cranes, they can handle ships much bigger than they could when the bridge was built in 1977, but the bridge was not hardened against a vessel striking it. Like we saw down in Tampa after the hit of the Skyline Bridge uh, back in 1980, Skyway Bridge, excuse me, in 1980. Yeah, you know, a lot of people have been talking about this. They said, why, why didn't the tugs, right? There's tugs in the port. Why don't the tugs just bring them through the key bridge? Why isn't that a part of the regulation? So a couple of reasons. Number one, they weren't required, so there's no reason to have tugs do it. It's an easy navigable channel. It's not that hard to go in and out. Uh, and then the other issue really is it, it depend, if you put tugs on them, that's going to slow down the process. There was a ship that just left prior to uh, – the vessel uh, Dolly left, that would have slowed up the process and it adds cost to it. And let's not forget, you know, 99 point ever, how many nines you want to add? Ships go under bridges every day without a problem. Again, what we had here was a catastrophic loss of power. You know, you and I driving on the highway together will pass each other at 55 miles an hour. And the only thing separating us is a 16th of an inch of yellow paint. Mm. Uh, you know, it, would it be safer to have a barrier up between us the entire way? Of course. But that's not economical, and unfortunately, that's what we see. Now, some ports are re-looking at that. I know, talking to some pilots and some port associations, they are re-examining that. Do we need escort tugs, at least during passage of vital infrastructure like bridges? 
Interesting. And because there's, there's a lot of conspiracies that formed around there. Uh, you're, are, are, do you agree with what most people are saying that it, it ran out of power? It lost that power twice. <laughs> uh, what happens in that? Because a lot of people, when they see that video, they go, oh, it took a sharp turn into there. Obviously, it's <clears throat> intentional. But in your trained eyes, what did you see there? No, no. So what I saw is this. Number one, I sailed for many years. And let me be clear, when a ship, the worst sound you've ever heard on a ship is silence. Yeah. Because that means you've lost control. And it is it is the deafening sound of silence. And when you lose control, that means, in this case, when they lost power, they lost power to the, the, to the control. So understand, ships have two different power sources. You have the main engine, which turns the propeller. And then you have generators, which provide all the other power. They, at the very least, lost the generators. And what that meant was all the control systems, including the rudder, went out. So we don't know if they still have the propeller spinning. Probably so. <coughs> Excuse me. And so when the power goes out, you don't have control. Now, the power came back on. 58 seconds after the power went off, we see power come back on. We don't know if that was the emergency generator, which should have came on faster than that, or if it was the ship restoring power. But in the meantime... There are forces acting on the ship. There's a channel right there coming out of Curtis Bay that may have pushed the vessel. It may have been what started that vessel to look like it's turning toward the uh, bridge. Uh, if they did not have rudder control, there's nothing you can do. Uh, you're literally riding a 100,000 ton ship at 10 miles an hour, eight knots. What the ship did was they got on the VHF radio, they alerted the bridge so that they can cut traffic on the bridge, which is amazing. They were able to do that as quick as they could. And they dropped the port anchor, which was not going to stop the vessel, but it may have been able to drag the vessel back toward the channel a little bit. But the worst thing is they lost, it appears they lost steering. And that's the question I have for the NTSB, because while we hear, heard reports that they were giving helm orders and rudder control orders via the recording, the vessel data recording, what we don't know was the rudder actually responding. Because even with the loss of power, as long as they had emergency power to the rudder, they should have been able to coast under the bridge. But what we saw was obviously the opposite of that. So we just don't know at this point. They've released a little bit of the response plan here. I got, I have an image, and it sounds like they're going to need a lot of specialized equipment, things like floating cranes and whatnot. What happens with uh, with this plan, Sal? Yeah, so that's out from the Army Corps of Engineers in Baltimore, that plan. And like you said, you're really looking at three different salvage operations. You've got the ship, number one. The ship is grounded forward because it has several thousand tons of bridge on top of it. Uh, they've got to be worried about an underwater uh, gas pipeline that's in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. So they got to be careful that they just don't drag the vessel off of it and create a problem there. They've got to clear the bridge, those uh, F, B, and C you see right there. The bridge is right across the main channel. So they can actually drag the bridge out of the way, but they got to get the bridge off the ship first. And then you have the remaining bridge that's outside the channel that has to be done. So vessel stabilization is the key. They got to get the dolly out of there. And right now the crew is still on board. They still have the ship running because it's still an operational vessel. But the big plan is how are they going to remove the bridge from off the ship? What they're doing right now is kind of outside that view. Everything that's being done is to the left side of that screen up above the north side of the federal channel trying to get either either girders removed lighten the structure or to put the channel in so best estimates are it's going to take anywhere from one to three months to clear the the channel so that we can see the resumption of ships heading up into baltimore uh, you, you know biden caused some controversy or people ran with this he said you know we're gonna pay for this ship and people took that or some people took that to mean that there's no insurance involved the the federal government's gonna take on this entire burger themselves and they're gonna rebuild but i don't think it means that who who is paying for this sal no i, I mean what you see right now is money being allocated for the the use right now they're not gonna wait it's like getting in a car wreck and you decide to go get your car fixed you're not gonna wait for the insurance payment well in this case we're not waiting for the insurance payment the federal government is putting money out right now to get the process because we need the port of Baltimore open. So ships have insurance and they have layers of insurance. So there is a company, Britannia P&I, it's protection and indemnity, will cover up to $10 million. And then what they do is there's a club of 12, there's a dozen clubs work together. They provide the next level of 100 million. And then they actually have coverage that goes up to $3 billion. 
Uh, so there is a lot of insurance here that is potentially available, but obviously insurance companies, the one thing they hate to do is pay out insurance. Mm. So they're going to fight all this to the last. This is why we're not going to see any payouts till they determine liability. Because understand, everybody's going to sue everybody here. If I have a ship that's stuck in the port of Baltimore, I'm suing for loss of revenue. If I have a ship outside of Baltimore, Baltimore and I got to divert, I'm going to sue. Every, not alone is the six guys who have lost their lives going to sue. So the, the liability here is going to be extensive. The problem you have here is, is it's international shipping. The ship is owned by a Singapore company, which is in turn owned by a Japanese person. Uh, it is a Singapore flag vessel, the uh, lease to a Danish company, Maersk, uh, the classification society is Japanese. The insurance company is British. So the mess that we have here in international shipping is going to come to full force as we see the litigation. Let's not forget, it's been three years since Ever Given, and that litigation is still ongoing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, no doubt. But Sal, now I got to ask. There was a, another strike. There was a, in Arkansas. There was a river barge strike. Are our bridges safe? This happened over the weekend. Yeah, I, I mean, we see these kind of elisions happen all the time, unfortunately. And and we're fortunate that a lot of our infrastructure is designed to withstand this. So in in a lot of our rivers, a lot of the river bridges are designed to withstand these type of accidents, especially in barge and river because of the currents, winds, this happens more often than we think. We just seen one also on the Danube with the Bulgarian uh, uh, passenger uh, river ferry on that area. So these do happen. And because of media and because of sites like yours and mine, people get to see this and, and see it happen. The problem we do have is that we need to ensure that we are investing in the infrastructure so that they can withstand hits like this. The problem is the bridge in Baltimore was designed for ships that were built 50 years ago, half the size of what Dolly is today. And when you look at the difference between the new bridge they built in Tampa after the old bridge, you see that. You see the main uh, foundations are on artificial islands. There are these big, round, concrete dolphins around the legs of the pier. Those are the type of things we need to invest in. The problem is it's not sexy. No one wants to invest in current infrastructure. I much rather cut the ribbon on a new bridge than rebuild an old bridge. And unfortunately, we learned a lesson the other night when the key bridge was taken out by the dolly and six workers died on board. Yeah, that 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 bridge was built right before some of those like dolphins and, and newer build styles were coming in too, right after the uh, the Skyway Bridge you'd mentioned earlier. Yeah. So, I mean, 77, we the Skyway Bridge was in 1980. We were seeing actually right across over where Star Sparrows Point is, the old shipyard, they were building ships the size of Dolly at the time. But again, nobody envisioned those size vessels going into the port of Baltimore. And again, this is something I hop on a lot. We have to be ha looking at our waterways a lot more. We have to invest in them a lot more. Ports on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast have underwent a huge expansion to take advantage of these larger ships. They're literally building the ports to attract larger ships. Charleston, Savannah, uh, New York, New Jersey, Houston. We want these big ships coming in because it's more efficient. It lowers the costs for cargo. But at the same time, we've got to be looking at more than just draft and cranes. We've got to be looking at the protection for where these ships are sailing. And if we need to require, you know, if Tomorrow, the Port of Baltimore says, you know what, we're going to require tugs and barges, escorts. That's great. It doesn't do any good if the other ports aren't requiring it, because if I'm a shipper and it's going to cost me more to go into Baltimore because I got to require a tug and barge, I'll go to another port because it'll be cheaper and more economical. We have to be unified on this. So before I let you go, you think that the regulation changes around tugs? I know San Diego, I believe also you don't need to use tugs to go through the bridge. You think that changes at all? I think it's going to be in the individual ports, they're going to look at that. So I wouldn't be surprised, San Diego, with the Coronado Bridge. You've got half the U.S. Navy Pacific Fleet on the other side of that. You know, But there are other bridges that have a lot of robust protection around it. You may not need that. 
And so I think it's going to be a case by case basis. I think what we really need to do, and I've been talking about this for a long time, is really do a port examination. This should be in the, the, the purview of the Maritime Administration. Do a port, port survey and identify key infrastructure that needs to be upgraded and targeted. We've done this with bridges, looking at bridges that are falling apart, that our trucks and railway are going across across, but we need to be looking at it from the bottom, from the water side also. Bridges that have exposure like this. Let's not forget the reason the bridge collapsed is Dolly physically ran into the bridge. They actually hit the bridge. They didn't even hit the bottom of it. They actually took out the concrete pillars and the steel, uh, uh, basically abatements underneath it by running the ship into it. You can see part of the pillars on the bow of the vessel along with the entire bridge across it. Wow. Well, hey, Sal, before I let you go, I pulled the audience. Should April Fool's Day be banned? 54.4% of you say, yeah. What do you think? I, yeah, but I don't know if they're serious or not. They may just be joking about that, and therefore they want April Fool's Day to be continuing forever. Uh, I've been victim of April Fool's Day way too much. I always think about doing a video for April Fool's Day. My problem is if I do something that I think would be funny, somebody would use it in the future against me. So I, I kind of always uh, avoid it, like a, like a pro Jones Act video. I, I would be I would be forced to eat that for a long time. Yeah, they'll use it again. That's the problem with the internet. Well, Sal, you have an amazing channel. People who want to go check you out, or they want to go check out Campbell University, where do I send them to? Hey, uh, well, you always go to Campbell, uh, uh, Campbell.edu, check out Campbell University. It's a great university here in beautiful Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. You can follow me on Twitter at Mercogliano S, or the best spot probably is over on YouTube at What's Going On With Shipping. Sal, so, thank you so much. Thanks for joining me the day after Easter. I appreciate it. Dooner, once again, happy 700, brother. Thank you. Take care. All right, everybody. Meanwhile. Hey, everybody. This is Britton Douglas with Douglas Nissan. I just want to introduce you to this Ram 1500. Just flew onto our lot, and it's going to go yeah, fast. Thomas, Come on down. We're crushing the competition. He's got Britton Douglas truck there. Nissan. Another truck that would be on his lot anyway crashed onto the top of that, uh, oh, no. that SUV over there. And you know what he did? He's like Hunter from Truck Parking Club. He just instantly cuts like a TikTok and an ad for his business. <laughs> It works. I mean, look, never let a uh, opportunity or disaster go to waste in no, this industry. No, was Q1 a disaster? Was Q1 a disaster in the truckload market? I remember that it was controversial because I remember in January, Craig saw some numbers. He was excited, and then Groundhog Day came, and no one's excited. Oh yeah, no. The April Fool's joke was that uh, if I told you the spot market was improving, well, psych, April Fools, it is not. Uh, we got a pump fake. Q4, we saw a little bit of life. So that was the good news. There was some life in the industry. We know that capacity has left. We really was hoping, though, that we would accelerate into spring. And what happened? Well, we went into the same old habits as we were in Q3 and Q4. When we look at the data, I, I got juked out, too. I thought Groundhog Day would be the turning point. I thought April Fool's would be the turning point. Yeah. Now I feel foolish. So I need another holiday to, uh, to place my hopes and dreams. Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at some of the data driving the market. First, we got our outbound tender reject index. What is this saying to us today, Thomas? 3.74% under 4. I mean, when you're looking at the contract world. That's terrible. It's very terrible. I mean, that's 95%. So you can get away with a customer like a 5% rejection yeah. rate. If it's really below five, if it's below four, that means you're starving. It's like hungry, hungry hippos, and you're just hitting as much as you can just to pull stuff in the system. That also shows why spot rates are also sluggish, because these large carriers, if you only have 10%, let's say it goes up to 15% if it gets that low. Now you're on the spot market, and I can go cheaper. If I have 5,000 trucks, I'll go a dollar, and then someone on operator will get on social media and complain, but that's just how the game's played. That's you know? what the, pick, the pickier you can be, the more garbage freight that ends up in there, too. When you get down into like the 373s, for those of you who don't know what the outbound tender reject index is, that means that ninety over 96% of contracted freight is being accepted. Yeah, 96%. Auto accept. So they're just like, you know what? There's so much capacity. Our rates are good. We don't need to go to spot. And then there's none of that volume going to the spot market that, that you would need to buoy it up. Exactly. If the vibe check was 5 to 10% kind of feels like the, the Goldilocks zone. Some will say 5 to 7. Anything over like 10 to 15%, we know that kind of like a catfish at the bottom. It's going to matriculate into the spot market because enough people will reject it. The waterfall backs up. And I got to go elsewhere. And so we've been this way for good Lord, over at least a year where the only time we saw it getting above 5% was on the holidays. So it's really hard looking ahead. And we have some other charts talking about these things, but it, in terms of unprecedentedness, 
it's just we don't know how much capacity has to leave because of how skewed our data is. So when we're looking forward now, all we can really do is know what happened a week or two ago and say, well, it, it still sucks. Well, let's talk about that. Let's take a look at carrier authorities. Who's leaving the market? I heard that the rate of egg people are still exiting, but the rate of exits has actually slowed down. Exactly. Looking at that chart, you see at the very far right, there's a little bit of green. That's right. That's hope, people. So when we look at this data set, I have a few years pulled up. One thing that stands out, there's a big hump because of the pandemic. And then when rates crashed, there's a big negative hump. Green is positive, more came in than left, red is a negative. The issue we're running into is, as you can see on this map, if you look at the historical nature, Americans buy more, we ship more. There's generally a lot of capacity entering the market and it only takes a little bit to leaf to change it. You see these little bitty divots of, of red. Well, now we're, we're kind of screwed. Look at this, how, do you, how am I gonna predict, <laughs> looking at this data, where, what amount of red, what amount of equilibrium and is so- Is necessary. Is necessary, and I don't think anyone knows that answer. Now, we have to look at this from other edges, outbound tender rejection rates, spot market rates, expectations like that, uh, imports, ocean, you know? Well, that's, I mean, that's because if you look at like one of these red lines, it goes down pretty deep, but if you were to make your prediction back then, you'd probably look at that and you go, wow, this is really accelerating. There is no way in hell by April Fool's Day, we will be a sub 4% outbound tender reject rate with that amount of exit, but here we are. Oh yeah. That's why this market's so confusing. And I think that's the biggest thing. It's confusing and whenever you're, if you're a resident expert or you're in this industry with a pulse, it still feels weird and your gut tells you why is it still feel so long? Which is like a hangover. This whole red is a huge hangover. And so that is impacting our rates. The whole rate environment right now is continuing to be uh, rough. And if you look at our expectations, so we have a spot rate forecast. Yeah. There was a big drop around late April, early May of last year, okay. the big dip. So when we look at our data set, AI uses training data. Well, we're predicting another big dip. And my, my opinion is it's not gonna materialize like last time, there is a floor, but that doesn't, what I'm trying to say is in the next month, if you're asking, will it get better? Well, no, it's still just going to suck. Now by May, May or June, Hopefully we'll see produce in full swing. Reefer has been a lot more life in it. So has Open Deck. But anything in the drive in segment is going to continue to have uh, troubles. What's our seven-day average telling us on here? So seven-day average is it's supposed to go up. I think we're about uh, 234 here coming up there on that little bit of yellow thing because we were like 228. Yeah, so we're 228 at a national spot rate right now, right? Exactly. With so this fuel. is all in. With fuel? Yeah, all in. Yeah, with yeah. fuel. So we're looking at all in rates. And when you're looking at the yellow, I'm adding in the daily because the daily impacts the weekly. So if you notice now how spiky it is above the white line, that means that we do expect in the next few days that this rate will continue to tick upwards. So you can always tell when it gets pulled down because you can see the gravity and the weight from the from the yellow. So one thing that sticks out though is that notice how we almost have started at the same place we stopped in this data set. We've yeah. come full circle here. So uh, yeah, it's it's going to be challenging. For owner operators and other drivers on the road, I always like to say, even though this is rough, if you've been around this industry, you have a solid business plan, you understand your lanes, you have one customer that gives you better rates through contract, and you're going to be okay. A lot of the folks who are really struggling are the ones who were only exposed to spot market rates. Those are the ones who just took out that truck uh, lease. They got their truck in the past like two years or one year. Yeah. Newer authorities, those are the ones most at risk. So DV is ass, drive in is ass. We've established that. Let's take a look at the next chart here. Are we looking any better? Do you like what you're seeing in flatbed or reefer rates? I believe that in the reefer we're looking at 256 flatbed 274 that's again on a national all-in level bullish on open deck flatbed open deck any kind of heavy that had the reject rates right last time you're on were we at like 20 percent reject rates in the uh in the flatbed we did we went down to settle around the 15 ish but that's okay. healthy because open deck contracted rates have continued to overperform and when we look at that data and we see that little bit of green showing up yeah the theory is that these new entrants should be approaching the reefer in the heavy haul segment and we should be seeing more covering that that uh supply because the 274 on the spot right as well infrastructure I mean, there's the infrastructure bill, we have the CHIPS Act, all these other things. There's a lot more infrastructure activity with nearshoring. There's infrastructure in terms of warehousing and distribution centers getting built in certain areas. So we should continue to Bridges see that demand. Bridges being removed from Baltimore. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a, a lot going on. There's an yeah, open deck carry very excited right now. They're going to have to, all of those beams are going to have to come through via heavy haul, including all the equipment, all of the generators. Everything's going to be hauled on an open deck trailer. So, you know, keep an eye on that market to see as it does get repaired in the coming months, will we see a surge in outbound rejection rates and stuff for flatbed? Well, I don't think we will in drive van. Let's take a look at our 28 day outlook here. 
What are you leaving us with, Thomas? What do, do we have anything to look forward here? This looks bad to me. This is 217. This looks like we're losing 11 cents. Well, here's the April Fools because look at the very far left. We had a huge dip last time, a little bit around that middle part of April going into May. So our model is saying, well, there was a dip last year. Will yeah. there be a dip? Now I'm gonna call April Fools because as you notice, there's a tiny blue line right there that was our actual versus projected. It turns out that every, hundreds of thousands to millions of small fleets and owner operators by not agreeing, but doing their own self-interest decided to make a price floor. So this isn't like everyone got on the phone and WhatsApp and said, guys, let's hold our rates. Because people say that online. That really makes me mad. They say, drivers, if we just all band together, there's no banding together. There's no honor among thieves and there's no agreement on spot rates. I'll undercut you if I need that freight. But this is the April Fool's Day pump fake because I'm very confident that rates will probably be between 220 and 225 at the lowest just because this looks to be more of a model anomaly because we had such a massive drop this similar time last year. It's putting a lot of weight, but like we said earlier, full circle, we don't really know that it's going to get marginally better. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe it could get that low, but that's my April Fool's prediction. Should we ban April Fool's Day? 54% of my audience says yes. Oh, oh got to gotta keep it. You know, just to see who's really paying attention. Just to see who's really paying attention, <laughs> especially in media. I think that's why you're so averse to it. You don't want to tweet something out that's wrong. Like, who's on autopilot? Yeah. Who's ready for the, the rage bait and all that other stuff, you know? Well, hey, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for giving us some clarity on the market. Go check him out on Loaded and Rolling and, of course, on our Freeways Radio once in a while. Like today. Exactly. On What the Trap. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. Thanks for joining by. All right, elsewhere, let's see what we got here. All right, so you audio listeners, gentleman in FJ Cruiser is driving on the beach. He's going through the water. There's a, there's an, there's a gentleman in the foreground. He sees him coming. I, he might know this guy because he ran away as fast as he could. He's trying to do a little maneuvers. Now he's even going near the guy who ran away from him. And the gentleman just got ejected. He just got ejected from that FJ Cruiser out the window. But he is not dead. Look at him. He got right back up and he's shaking his leg. He is walking this injury right off. He just saved so much face. Like if he had died there, you never lived that down. If he had had to be taken out by an ambulance, you never lived that down. But like if you walk away, Kind of looks like, you know, maybe that was intentional. He could pull that off. Adam Newman's chief of staff says, I like how he just walks it off. Elias Moji says, good form, but a little rough on the landing. 10-4 Rubber Ducky says, thank you for helping rid the world of one more FJ Cruiser. Steve says, self-eject mode activated. And Cabrillo says, walk that off like a champ. Sure did. All right, Matt Dickman, founder at Dickgistics LLC. What is up, Matt? How are you doing? How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Where are, you, uh, where are you coming in from? You an Iowa guy, or you just went to school in Iowa? I went to school in Iowa, and now I'm uh, in Phoenix. Phoenix, man. How do you like the Phoenix scene? I mean, I love it. There's no snow. It's great weather. It's also 9.30 in the morning for me. <laughs> so at 9.30 in the morning, does Dick Gistics have anything to do with healthcare? I have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, is, what is Dick Gistics for those who don't know? <laughs> so uh, it's a it's a warehouse consulting firm. Um, so basically, pretty much anything warehousing. So you have uh, just e-commerce warehousing itself. Um, you can have warehouse setup. Um, you could have the tech side of it. Um, I started out everything doing e-commerce, um, but I've done the pick and pack. I've done uh, the skid in, skid out, um, racking layouts. Like I said, carrier negotiations. Um, I like to say I'm a glorified warehouse manager. So yeah. Well, beautiful. Let's talk about the look because I know that this is relatively new, this work of art that is your logo. Tell me a little bit about what went into the, the design of the Dick Gistics brand. Well, it was uh, basically, obviously, having the last name of Dickman. It's, uh, you know, you got to embrace it or you got to be against it. So yeah. obviously embraced it. And uh, a couple of years ago, I came up with the name as a joke um, when, when I was working at a company. And because uh, we were booking the freight and I called it the Dick, Dick Gistics log. And then I just stuck with the name and went with it and um, basically kind of kind of went from there. And then I kind of did a little play on the on like the FedEx logo, but you know, like the EX thing. And uh, you know, obviously there's some some hidden things in there. Yeah, yeah, like the EX has the hidden hidden arrow. I'm not sure what might be hiding in yours. Were, were, you mentioned FedEx, were you, did, you didn't happen to be inspired by this carrier, were you? Me? Oh. Yeah, you weren't inspired by these guys, were you? Well, that's that's one of my other LLCs, actually. That's one of yeah. the old Lot Lizard Express is one of your LLCs. Well, that's I mean, hey, when you get the last mile, you got to get it in there. So yeah. So why why do they call you the Gordon Ramsay of warehousing? 
So um, <clears throat> one of my big specialties is going into warehousing and basically kind of flipping it. So I go into a lot of, I'm like, quote unquote, the fixer. So I go into warehouses, unfortunately, sometimes have a lot of issues, um, lot, basically behind in orders, bad process. So I go in, I've been known to make uh, some people cry, fire a lot of people, um, you know, you got to do the got to do the dirty work, right? So if you ever seen like Kitchen Nightmares, Hotel, you know, those things with Gordon Ramsay, kind of those types of things. I go in those things. I'm just like, I can't believe some of the stuff I see, but um, they do go very well once I've, I'm through it. And some of them are a lot easier. Some of them are a lot more difficult. You're like, you're kind of like bar rescue for a warehouse, I yes. guess, right? Yes. W like what is, whenever like Tatman goes in there, he always finds there's all, like 80% of the problems are almost all the same. Like across the board for all those places he goes into, they're all screwing up like 80%. Then they have like their own particular things. What is like the biggest screw up people are doing now? When you go in, you're like, how does so many warehouses not know to do this properly? The, the biggest one is, and a lot of warehouses still use paper to pick and pack, right? So I go, walk, I mean, I'm the guy that'll walk in a warehouse and at the end of the day, they're like, they think I'm in charge because I just go around and I look for things. And a couple warehouses have been in, I found stacks of like order pick tickets and I pull them off the shelf and they're orders from like six months ago. And they're like, where'd you find those? And I'm like, well, they're in the back of the warehouse. So, and then the other thing too is I've also seen inventory just everywhere, right? It's at packing stations. It's not put away correctly. Um, you know, people don't do lot tracking and those types of things. And then they end up with a lot of expired stuff. So that's a very common thing. And then the other common thing too, is just not watching, um, your packaging material, right? So you run out of the most simplistic things, no shrink wrap, no boxing, uh, tape, all those types of things. There's no full process and those types of things. And they're just kind of running with their head cut off at the end of the day. What's the weirdest thing you used to, you, you found in a warehouse? Because I used to, uh, I worked at Talbot's for a little bit and um, they'd make you work in the warehouse once a week. So you like knew what operations were going on and, and um, you'd open boxes and you, a lot of times you find box cutters in there from like the Chinese factory worker or whomever. You'd also find people's badges. And um, I'd always like be concerned. I'd be like, I hope that person didn't get, you know, like killed or something because they lost their badge. <laughs> What's the weirdest like, Don't thing order you? from us again. There's the knife. No, yeah. like, who are you? You know, you're going in the gulag. <laughs> Uh, the weirdest thing uh, was we had these uh, warehouse I worked at in Chicago. It was actually one of my first ones. Um, we had held, handheld scanners. They're like they're like two thousand dollars, right? And I had you know we, we had a looser process and putting them away. And then I'm like, what? We lost one. So then I had to take basically it was kind of Chicago style. I ended up making a cage and I had to take people's IDs uh, to make sure that we were you know obviously not losing any of them. We did lose one, and then six months later, one ended up in Australia in a box. Interesting. Now, so, like, there's been, <laughs> and someone's like, "Hey, I hope that guy's not I mean, it's, dead." It's interesting because it made it through a plane and had lithium ion, so they must have not caught that one. But you know, it is what it is. Yeah, you never know. Sometimes that happens with your luggage too. They always like they they almost the TSA will almost always pull my cowbell out of my bag, except for once. And I was like, I'm like, what is this guy slipping through when I was coming back from Matt's? He's the only guy to not pull it out. The only TSA agent ever. And I'm like, what else does this guy not see on the scanner? I, I, love I need I'm to audit you. And I always get I always get the random. I'm like, it's not random anymore if I've been in 100 flights and I keep getting checked every time. So, yeah. <laughs> hey, Matt, how come so many warehouses and DCs right now are getting targeted for theft? I mean, theft is a big thing in general, but why aren't warehouses being a better control point? Why aren't DCs being a better control point? What are these thieves doing? Um, I mean, a lot of it is inside jobs, right? So yeah. it's a lot of people that, you know, it's, uh, I had one client, we had some freight stolen, um, you know, who knows if they were talking to the manufacturer, those types of things. Um, but a warehouse, you know, for example, you go to like Walmart and you see like all that security prevention, all that stuff, a warehouse, unless it's like a massive facility, like an Amazon or anything like that, it's their security, but it's not like they're checking everyone's bag in and out. Um, it's a lot easier to get things going. And then obviously if people know what's in the warehouse, they know people and all those things. And then they kind of find out street value and then they go for that. So, I mean, security is one big thing. Um, setting up cameras is another thing too. A lot of warehouses I go into, they have no security of any kind, no cameras, no nothing. And I'm like, you can't, you can't trust them because, you know, so-and-so in the corner over there that worked here for 10 years could have been screwing you over for about 10 years and they don't even know it. How do you sniff out those double agents you were mentioning? Like the inside job guy, how do you, how do you figure out who that is? So I've, I found a few um, and uh, I'm kind of... Uh, you know that movie, Mr. Deeds, you know, yeah. like the little sneaky uh, butler. It's like me. I just pop out everywhere. So I, just, <laughs> I walk around and I see, and then also I watch the cameras. I, I mean, I, right now I have about five to six clients um, and I oversee their warehouses and I watch cameras and all that stuff. And I still catch things. I'm not even in the state. Um, so you just have to really be on top. You have to watch everything because you never really know at the end of the day. You think, you know, so-and-so is, 
is a good person, but at the end of the day, they don't, they don't care about your business. They just, they want money and then they, they make more money if they can't make more. Ugh. What should truck drivers know about warehouses other than like bring your steam deck? Cause you might be waiting a while. Uh, I would say for warehouses now, I mean, I put a lot of, I put a couple of policies in place now is that, um, the MC number game, and uh, I'm sure, you know, Reed, um, uh, you know, from lost freight, sure. um, it's interesting now the people are using people, other people's MC numbers. Um, it's getting more and more dangerous, especially when you book loads. I had one driver uh, recently, I was like, wait, you have a different MC number. And then I had to go through and everything like that and figure it out. Cause that's how, you know, freight gets stolen. So, I mean, going in there and then also making sure that they sign off on loads. I've also had drivers, uh, you ever heard of Uber freight? I'm sure you have. Sure. Um, they, uh, they would actually say they marked my load as delivered a day before. So he could pick up another load. And I was like, you just marked it delivered and said all this stuff showed up. And then they were trying to invoice us. I'm like, I didn't even get the freight yet. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting world out there. How do you feel about gamification? That was uh, like, I remember during the pandemic, there were a bunch of like gamification companies that popped up and there were people that were sending me PR requests about like warehouse gamification. But like lately, I haven't heard that much about it. I was curious what you thought. I'm sorry, what, what were you saying? Like gamification, warehouse game, like warehouse workers, like, you know, you, you pick and pack 20 things, you get gems and stuff. Gamification. Oh, those. Yeah. No, I haven't heard too much about that. I mean, it, I know they were all, all the things kept popping up here and there. Um, I mean, if there's a dollar to be made, someone, someone's going to figure it out. <laughs> so someone's going to figure out, well, what's, what's one trend in warehousing that you love right now? Um, for me, I kind of like the, um, the carrier game, right? Cause everyone's just, there's always different carriers, especially, you know, small parcel, right? It's always, it's kind of like a game. It's like a lotto, right? It's like, well, who's going to give the best rates, right? And you go back and forth. Um, and I kind of like to mess with them a little bit here and there, you know, it's, you go with it, you get the better rates and, you know, they always say, oh, you know, we have better service and this and that. At the end of the day, last miles, last mile, there is certain things there, but you got to stay on top of it or else they'll just, they'll keep taking advantage of you. And then you, you know, obviously keep the rates uh, going there it keeps me on my toes because everyone every carrier fedex ups you know whoever they all keep coming out with different types of uh, service levels and all those things and i'm just it's hard to keep uh keep uh, keep track of all of them at this point matt let's uh, let's raise some strap work i got i got a video for you here let's let's roll this one for you audio listeners what you're seeing is this is a couple of, apparently at their wedding i think and there's they're off a, the side of a cliff here in russia and there's a giant like uh cable you know, like when you go zip lining, it's like a zip line cable, but they have a dinner table on it with a, uh, a bride and groom, and they look absolutely terrified, especially the bride. Well, I mean, they should have this in Vegas. In Would Fremont. you do this? Like, did you, first of all, are you married? Have you done like staged engagement photos before, like wedding photos? I am, I am not married, so I am a, I am a single digistics man over here. Well, is this giving you ideas about maybe like the first <laughs> I mean, it would. I've done some spontaneous things. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I try. It really, the question is though, what happens if you have to? How do you get the food though? If well, I have a translation here too. Daniel Chovnik, CFA, says, "What's even more hilarious that someone is asking the woman screaming in the background, is that your son?" And someone replies, "We have no clue who he is." They just all those people <laughs> that live there just like send it. We just, we just well, maybe want you to see just this. line up like a ride at Six Flags. You just get in there. You just get on with some random person. <laughs> Lawrence Hansen says, drop your napkin and it's gone. Drop a fork and it might kill the guy who went to pick up your napkin. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I actually, the funny thing is I saw that video recently and then the FJ Cruiser thing, which was a great way, great intro for me. That's how I, uh, that's the current car I drive. No, I'm just kidding. No. Well, Chad Barbier says, in Russia, strap work rates you. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you didn't happen to make it down to Matt's, did you? No, I didn't. No, no, I no. Believe I believe uh, our next strap work is from Matt. Take a look at this one. Look at this tiny truck rolling down here. He's even got a can on the back of that thing. He's got a, the he's future got a, generation yeah, the of trucking going. right here. It's a little kid driving a truck. The only thing some people have pointed out is that uh, it's being pushed by two men. It's not under its own power. But it's got the steam, so you think it's working. It does. I mean, yeah, it's a good kit. You ever build it? You ever do like a Pinewood Derby in uh, Boy Scout? Yes, I did. A, yeah, I did that. A couple times, uh, and was it Cub Scouts? Yeah, Cub Scouts did those. And then also the, the cars with little CO2 cartridge in the back. I forgot the name of it. They're wooden, but I can't remember that name as well. Wayne says, impressive as it is, some folks have way too much time on their hands. Well, I don't know. You know, sometimes it's fun to do things like that for your kids. You only get them, you only get them once. Now, all right, poll of the day. Should April Fools be banned? 54.4% of you say yes. Where do you sit on this one, Mr. Dick Gistics? 
I don't, I don't think it should be banned. I think it should be around. I mean, the April Fool's is a great time to mess with people and then uh, they can have a little good fun there. And also you can get- try something. And see, like, for example, I, I also launched my merch store today. People may think it's a, it's a joke, but hey, if it makes sales, then it's going to keep going. It's going to keep going. <laughs> Everyone ever, anyone ever get you good? Um, yeah, there's been a couple. I can't actually uh, pinpoint the ones on there, but uh, some of them, well, I remember actually, no, I can't remember exactly which ones they are. But yes, there's been a couple that I've been uh, bruised from, especially from text messages. People, I'm like, oh, I get a text from someone. I'm like, haven't heard him forever. And then it was a, it's a fake person. Yeah. Wow. I'm going to go mess with some people after the show. We're almost out of time, but people want to connect with you. They want to reach you. Where do I send them to? Yeah. So go to uh, dickjsticks.com. Uh, definitely hit me up on there. Uh, I got my email on there. Like I said, I also just launched the uh, the merch site. I did uh, um, I did a promo code for What the Trucks, so a WTT, get 10% off. And uh, really uh, appreciate you guys. Hope to talk to you guys soon. Hey, thank you very much for joining us, Matt. Take care. Have a great week. Hopefully Q2 is better than Thomas Watson's prognosis. Everyone drive safe out there. Thanks for joining me. Find me on Twitter or on social media at Timothy Duner. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. Find the show at FW of the Truck across social media platforms. Hey, everybody, take care. And don't be a stranger.